How you doing? Yeah, so I'm going to start from the beginning. I know it says that you went to Juilliard, right? I studied theater at Juilliard for two years. It was a four-year program, and I was there for a couple of years. That was way back in the day. Um, and uh, they used to cut the class down. They used to cut. They used to have a, a cut in the middle of the in the middle of the four-year program, and I didn't make the cut. So oh. it, it was a classical. It's classical theater training, right? So. Um, you know, we, we studied Shakespeare and, and, and got really in depth with it. And, um, and um, I'm not sure it was my cup of tea, at least at age 20. I was like 20 years old when I did that. And so I was 19 and 20 when I was there. And so then I left New York and, uh, and then I eventually went to uh, film school because I also had an interest in that. And so I did that at UT in Austin. And then I've, since then I've been a video editor and, and also doing some theater, uh, but a lot of voice acting as well. So that's been for like the past 25 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was there, was there any aspiration to like, after you were done with Julia, was it, was there any aspiration for you to like move to Los Angeles? Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I, don't, I don't think I'd get, I don't think I'd do very well in LA. LA's a little too big for me. Um, no, I didn't, I didn't want to go try to try my luck as an actor, either in New York or, or LA. One thing Juilliard taught me was how, how difficult, um, the whole business is if you're just trying to be an actor. In fact, one of the first things they told us when we got there was, hi, welcome to New York City. If you can do anything else and be happy, you should do that instead. Mm -hmm. And that's what they told us. They said, this, that's, that's how difficult it is to try to be an actor in this world and, and make a living and be happy with it. You know, you had people, they would list all these really famous actors and actresses, these huge names that they knew. And they'd say, you know, right after this person got a Tony Award, they were in the unemployment line the week after that, or they did some movie and got a paycheck, and then they didn't work for two more years. And it's a it's a really it's a really hard business to uh, to make a living if that's all you want to do. Right. So you really you really have to have a passion for it, and and it, I think it really is true that that you have to really have to do it and not want to do anything else. Nothing else will make you happy. I'm lucky in that I also. I used to make, you know, home movies as a kid, and I used to make, I record a lot of tapes on cassette as a kid with my friends. Yeah. I make comedy, comedy tapes and funny movies, and and so I've been video editing for a really long time because that's 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 been my way of exploring that those talents that I have and, and letting that kind of breathe a little bit. And so, how long before you fell into doing voiceover for anime, where you are? You know, voice. Well, voice acting, I, let's see, when I got out of college um, at from film school, I came home and started to, um, a couple of my friends were already doing a, some commercials and doing some voice acting. And so I, I didn't get an agent or anything like that, but I did a few commercials for a little bit of money, just radio commercials. And I didn't really know a lot about the industry, but it was in late the late 1990s. ADV Films was uh, the only game here in town. Um, yep. I had not heard of Funimation. I hadn't heard of other studios, but Texas is a right to work state, right? So um, they used to have cattle call auditions. ADV was starting out kind of in, in the business in the late nineties and anime had not exploded yet. And they needed actors. They didn't have a, a pool of actors to choose from. So they, and Texas and Houston has a really big theater scene. You know, a lot of actors, a lot of stage actors uh, do a lot of work here in town. And so I was doing a little bit of stage work, but not very much. And, and I heard about a cattle call audition and I went to meet Matt Greenfield at ADV. And we were all in a room, just like in an audition um, for a play or something. We all waited our turn and we, and I just read some lines from Dirty Pair and and some other stuff. And I got, a, I got uh, Matt hired me later on. He said, we'll call you. And he, and he called me to do some roles and I just started getting, once you do one role and meet a couple of directors, they like what you do. They learn your range. And that's when it started. It was just an open, open audition at ADV. And then I've been working at ADV, which is now Sentai for, you know, close to 23 years now. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a long, been a long run. And then in the middle of that, I met some people at a convention who worked at Funimation and they said, why don't you give us a demo reel? And I got a hold of uh, Mike McFarland at Funimation and, we talked on the phone and the whole deal was you have to drive up to Dallas. You have to drive to Fort Worth from Houston on your own to back and forth to do some roles. And 
even if you've got a couple hours of voiceover, you got to come to the studio and do it. I said, okay, I'll do it. You know, it, it'll help me get some more roles. And I started to do that. And um, that started, I've been working with Funimation for at least 15, 16 years, probably about 2004 or five. Mm -hmm. So yeah, quite a while. That's been a good, that's been a good run too. So what are your, what are your first role in anime would have been the ADV dubs of the Dirty Pair movies? Yeah, the, I did Dirty Pair. There was Dirty Pair. I think the very first one I did, I want to say it was Sorcerer Hunters, but I'm not positive. Um, yeah. My very first role was this, I was this distressed father in this one little scene. And then, and I forgot what, the, but I think the second job I did was a Dirty Pair episode uh, where I played a villain in one of the Dirty Pair. I think I still have the VHS on my shelf back there. They used, we used to get copies of this stuff on VHS. Then we started getting DVDs. But yeah, I think that was my second role. And then I got a decent role in um, um, Bubblegum Crisis 2040. I played uh, Nigel, yeah. Nigel Kirkland. He was the, the mechanic. Um, and then it was in, then Martian successor Nadesco. Yep. Was another big role that I played all through all, through all the episodes. I was one of, the, one of the secondary characters in that. And I've mostly for ADV, uh, I've got a deeper, you know, bass baritone voice. And so I played more of the older people or, or, or the the cops, the dads, the detectives, you know, stuff like that. Didn't play a lot of the, the lead young roles, but um, the first lead role I got at ADV was in something called Area 88. Yep. I played a photographer uh, named Shinjo, and uh, that was really cool. Then I played a lead in Udawari Ramono a few years later. So I've had these big ro bigger roles that were kind of spaced out, but I've done a whole lot of secondary roles in Walla and uh, – and, um, crazy ones that kind of used either my ability for accents or, you know, I'm either a deeper role, like, or it just sounds like my voice or I'm some kind of really crazy part like this. And it, they would, it, you know, the range was pretty wide what they would use me for. I'm not sure uh, what the timeline was of this, but I know you were the, the narrator for the street fighter series too. Oh yeah, I did some did some Street Fighter. Yeah, I played a couple of roles in Street Fighter. Uh, Street Fighter Two, I think, was the was the an actual anime. I'm not sure. Yeah, sure. But yeah I, did, I did. I think I did a narration on Street Fighter. That was a fun show. Yeah, and um, you also got to do all the Sealy voices for the secondary dub of Evangelion. Uh, Evangelion. Um, Evangelion. I did. I think. When they redid Evangelion, I did uh, one of the, it was like this, this table of, it was, it was this disembodied voice. It was like right. this table of uh, elders or something like that. And it was, so I was one of those guys. And that was a pretty short, that was, that was a pretty short session because I didn't know they were going to redo Evangelion. They, they wanted to make the dub better. They're, they redo a lot of dubs. They redub them to get 5.1 surround and make them better than the 80s versions. And um, so ADV would take care, would, would be in charge of that. Yeah, so I was part of that one. I didn't realize that uh, you were in one of, the, one of the Slayers movies too. That was like an early- Slayers Gorgeous, I think? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I was in Slayers Gorgeous and I got to, I got to play like a Scottish king or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like Lord Calvert, we were talking about the House of Calvert. And my daughter was upset because, because I wouldn't give her an allowance. Mm -hmm. And I was telling her all about the whole history of the House of Calvary. She didn't care. She was just like, give me money. Give me my allowance, Dad. And that was a pretty funny role. I enjoyed Yeah, that was Slayer's Gorgeous, I think. That was on my old demo reel. That was oh. part of one of my old demo reels. Yeah. Do you, do you know uh, Cynthia or, or uh, Kelly Manison very well? I know Kelly Manison. Kelly Manison and I went to high school together. We were in the oh. same drama department here in Houston, here in Houston at the High School for the Performing and Visual Arts, and we were both in the drama department together. So Kelly and I have known each other for a long time. That's cool. Yeah, she's, good. she's a good friend of mine. She's really talented. She's a great voice actress. Mm -hmm. She's been in a lot of stuff, ADVs. She really, she really got some good stuff done in that. And did you just, uh, when you started anime dubs, did you, did you take to it? pretty easily or was it difficult for you at first yeah it, no it, it was fun it was it, the anime dubbing is a little difficult because um you know um 
And I tell people this a lot when they talk about becoming a voice actor or what, what is, what's your advice? The best advice I always give people is that it's, it's great that I'd been in acting school before and had had to do a lot of improv, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you go in to, when you get called to do an anime, you normally, you don't know anything about the show that you're doing. You don't know until you show up in the studio, what character you're playing, what the character looks like, who they are, anything about the, the show that you're doing, anything about the plot, you're just thrown it. Okay, we're in the middle of episode six and your character just went through this uh, second battle with so-and-so and the director will try to take some time to explain it to you so you can just kind of get into it. But it's like you're being given an improv exercise. You know, when you go to an acting class and you do an improv, the teacher will just say, okay, you are part of a religious cult and the cops are showing up and your daughter's getting arrested. Go, you know. It's great to have those kinds of skills to kind of think on your feet because that comes in really handy with anime because anime is almost like a cold reading improv every time you go in, right? Um, at least it is, it, that, that's the way I think I, I feel about it. A lot of my friends feel about it. And you also need to have some skill at, at timing because you're, you're looking at Japanese, you've got your headphones on, you're hearing the director, but you're also, you're hearing the Japanese kind of quietly in your ear and you're seeing that on one side of the screen and you're reading the script on the other side of the screen. So you got to read your lines come up with a voice, match the lip flaps. Mm -hmm. And it takes a couple of times usually to do it, to get it right or to speed it up or slow it down, whatever. You've got to match all that technically, plus give it some flavor and be, be, in, be in character, even if you don't know what's going on in the plot. And so that takes, that's a little challenging, but um, I got into it pretty easily and quickly. The directors are, are really good at helping you out with that. Plus, I'm, I've been a video editor for a long time and I know that, I don't know about other people, I can only speak for me, but my video editing came in really handy because learning how, how learning timing with video and, and I'm also a drummer and so kind of knowing pacing and having a feel for pace helped me when I was in the studio uh, kind of learn how long a line is. You know, this line kind of lasts this long in your head and you just kind of say and repeat it and then you know how long you need to talk or if you need to speed it up or slow it down and working in video for me has helped me a lot with that mm -hmm. so it, it wasn't it wasn't too difficult to get into I, I um and uh and I don't know how other people what skills other people have uh that help them with it but those are the things that help me out with it okay and generally it's are you easy, yeah. are you are you generally told to uh base your performance off the Japanese or well, how does that work? You know, it, it, it really, not really. Um, sometimes the director wants you to sound like the person sounds who does the Japanese, but it's more about how the person looks because mm -hmm. sometimes the Japanese actor doesn't really sound necessarily like the person looks. The person will look really tough and gruff and they'll have a higher voice. So they'll have a more relaxed voice and you'll say, Oh, that's interesting. You know, they chose that actor. Um, but when you, when you do it, the direct, it, 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 it depends on the director really. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'll just look at a character and go, well, what do you have in mind for this voice? Do you, do you see an accent? Is it, does it sound just like me, but with a little gruff, me a little more nasal, me a little more, whatever. And they'll, they'll give you a directive about that. And then you just kind of read a couple of lines and find out where it, they want it to sit. And usually what will happen is you'll, you'll do a few lines and then you'll start to get really into it and settle into it and get more comfortable a few pages down. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have to go back and do the first few lines over again because you're kind of in the zone later. You go in really cold and you're kind of finding it, finding the character. Then once you find it, you go back and fix it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's up to the director usually. They, some of them want it to sound like the Japanese, but not very often. They just want it to sound like, hey, what's... What's your, how's your voice going to treat this guy? Yeah. Um, how is your voice going to affect you know, how this character is going to come off, you know? And I know uh, well, probably one of like the first bigger action series that you had a major part in was Gasaraki. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. I'm looking at all these DVDs. I'm sitting across from my living room and I see them all on my shelf. I'm like, Gasaraki's over oh. there. <laughs> <laughs> They're all in my book. Though. Yeah, Gasaraki was, uh, I played General, gosh, I don't want to forget his name. Um, wait, so God, I'm going to go pick it up. Hold on one second. Okay. <laughs> Razafan for a minute. Razafan was different than Gasaraki. Okay. 
all these names juggle in my head. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Gasaraki was an older uh, was an older ADV title. And Matt Greenfield, Matt Greenfield directed most of the stuff that I did uh, at, in ADV for a long time. And he was director of Gasaraki. And this is probably really obvious, but especially for series like that, are you the kind of person that always gets uh, physical in the booth? I don't usually get very physical in the booth. I like to, I'm more cerebral. I'm, I can sit down in a chair the whole time and do and do a character and I don't have to wave my arms around and stuff like that. Sometimes it helps a little bit, but even on, even on really angry or emotional scenes, it's not unusual for me to, uh, um, to just sit in a chair and just get comfortable um, and, and, and just let it, let it be. Cause I like to focus and I like to see what's on the screen because all the all the action and everything of course is being done for you you're just you're just providing the vocal to to that element of it and everything else is done for you so if, like if you're a real actor you got to show up on set you've got to look correct you've got to look exactly like that character feels you've got to be dressed that way you've got to have the right energy and you've got to sound that right all that's done for you so i just like to get in there and really get focused on exactly what i got to sound like and um, it's not always easy, but when I, when I, but I don't necessarily have to be physical when I'm doing the role. Mm. Uh, I've done it a few times, but sometimes that can get in the way. For right. Me, anyway, some, act some actors have to do it. They have to like, like, cause they're used to doing it as stage actors, right? They're used to, or, or film actors. They, they are very used to getting into it emotionally if they can do the physical things that you're supposed to do um, or doing whatever that character's doing at the moment. But I, I can, I can, it can go either way for me. Okay. And since, since you uh, mentioned Razafan, I was going to bring that up next. Um, how was your, oh, handle, yeah. yeah, how was your handle on that character? He was a very soft spoken guy. He was very guilt ridden because he had uh, a, a, like a, an operation that he was in charge of was somewhat responsible for the death of his daughter yep. uh, on the planet that she was on. And so it, in the city that she was in when it got bombed. And so he, he was very reserved and he didn't like to get very emotional and he didn't like to get too into things because he, he was just, he was de dealing with grief all the time. He was carrying that guilt around. So I liked that because I liked to, I got to be very introspective and I got to be very quiet when I did that role. I was able to be more intellectual and cerebral and I kind of enjoy that because that's kind of more like me anyway. Um, but, uh, and you know, when you're in a booth for a long time and you've got to do a whole lot of yelling, I don't envy a lot of these characters who play lead roles and they have to scream for, you know, 12 episodes. Mm -hmm. I have some friends who literally like rack their throats out. I, so I was like, oh good, Rosa Fun's more, more quiet, more introspective, more reserved and, you know, and uh, I think that was, I think that role was a good fit for me. You're right. And, uh, he had to have authority, you know. He had to, he had to have a good good. He had to have a lot of authority, but he but he couldn't be too extreme, you know, because he had a lot of stuff. He took his job very seriously, and he had to carry it carry himself very carefully because of all the guilt he was carrying around. Mm -hmm. um, and I did. I, I thought it, I thought it was cool to see that you were in Tactics, because that's a show that I like that isn't super popular, but I think I mean it has. Oh, Nagica, Nagica, Nagica Tactics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Magic of Tactics was, God, you're bringing up a lot of kinds of, these are titles I haven't heard in a while. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. So you've been watching anime for a long time. Yeah, I, yeah, I have a, I have a preference for 90s series. There's only a few of like modern things that I focus on, so. <laughs> I understand. Yeah, you're more old school. That's cool. That's interesting. And I've done some real retro ones too. Vampire Hunter D, when we when we redid the dub for Vampire Hunter D, uh, which only took us a little bit of time because I only had a very I had very few lines, um, but that was based on the 1985 movie, right? That was way old school animation, so pre 90s, and it had a real cult following from then on. But the animation was really old school, and there's something kind of pure about it, and that there's something about the 90s shows that that. Maybe it's because maybe it's because anime hadn't exploded so much, and maybe because more, some of the more modern shows are based on the popularity of anime, and they they base storylines more on how popular they need to be. Not, and some people think they're not as much about story, but about audience appeal. Yeah, there's an argument with that. 
sometimes. So I don't know if that's why you like anime from the '90s more or not, or if that has anything to do with it. But some people are some people are kind of into that concept. Well, I was gonna uh, I'm gonna spring up now too. Yeah, but, well, uh, I, I actually really like the I, I really like Vampire Hunter D, and I I saw it when I was like really young. So um, I think both. <laughs> I think both dubs are actually really well done, but I'm guessing that the like how you guys did that was that just completely basing it off of like a brand new thing, like coming up with it yourselves. Yeah, yeah. Matt wanted all new voices for it, and uh, and I heard the I heard some of the original voices, and they're very different. You know, yeah. they're really different. Uh, I, I saw I saw a clip from the original '85 movie before we redubbed it. And yeah, he he got he got a whole new cast in there. I mean, it's all all different actors. Um, John Swayze was in that. I think Lucy Christian was in it. I was in it, and and uh, so yeah, there was it was a very different take on it. I, I and I like that though. I like I like the fact that because trying to sound like other actors, there's not really a, a purpose for that. I don't think um, mm -hmm. there's not anything about there's no need to replicate someone else's voice, and it's gonna it's, it's, that's probably gonna get in the way of an actor doing a good job if he has to constantly think about, oh, I've got to sound like this other person, you know. Um, so, yeah, that would be kind of difficult. But I, I think it's better if directors just kind of let it, let it have an original feel, you know, cast it based on their idea of who these people are and which actors do I know now that would fit into that well and not try to replicate something, you know, have a whole new, have a whole new spin on it because it makes it interesting, you know. Mm -hmm. And is uh, mm -hmm. is D one of the favorite characters you've played? He's one of them. Yeah, he's real stoic. I I, I usually get cast as these really stoic badass <laughs> guys who are kind of quiet. D's one of them, uh, and of course Mihawk in One Piece is another one. Um, that's one of my more well known roles, and he's extremely, you know, stoic and brave and badass, and he can't be touched, and he's almost kind of supernaturally. Uh, skilled and so very much not like me, but but really fun to play. It's fun to play those kinds of characters um, who are a little untouchable. But he's got some vulnerabilities, and I, I hope he I hope he comes back a little more uh, often in the show. He's kind of popping in and out. When we did the movie Stampede, I had like was it two lines? Yeah, I had two lines <laughs> as Mihawk. I was in a beach. I was like, hi, I'm Mihawk. Goodbye. <laughs> did my thing and split. Um, but that's kind of the appeal to his character. He's so kind of other level cool that they treat him that way. He just shows up every now and then. He doesn't want to wear out his welcome. He just shows up and he's a badass and then he splits. Mm -hmm. That's really fun. I, li I like that. I like him a lot. But because he, he's, he's got a real strong moral code too. Yeah. He's got a real he's got a real code that he sticks to. I like that about him. I like playing characters like that. Have you really gotten the chance to emote much with playing Mihawk? Not really, uh, for that very reason. He doesn't get very emotional. Yeah. He, 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 gets, he gets intense. He gets intense. Like when he's telling Zoro, uh, if you're a big fan of the show, when he's, when he's telling Zoro that he needs to get better and fight him, he's really inspired by Zoro's dedication and Zoro's stick to and his unwillingness to give up and that he'd rather die than lose a battle. And he mm -hmm. thinks that that's so cool. He's, like, he's almost like Sir Lancelot in King Arthur days because Lancelot – in the movie Excalibur a long time ago, it was a mid-80s movie, Lancelot's upset because he's like, I'm cursed. I can't find anybody who's as good as me. I've never met my match, and I want to meet my match. I want somebody to be able to beat me because I want a real challenge, and I want somebody to be on that level. Right. I think that's kind of what Mihawk's into, right? Mihawk meets Zoro, and he's like, oh, wow, you could, you could be on my level. I want you to be. And I hope one of these days they, the two of them have a, have a final battle. And maybe it's a draw, or maybe Zoro wins. I don't know what's going to happen. I have no idea what's going to happen with that. I don't know if that's going to happen ever. I hope it does. I hope we finally see what gets to happen with those two guys. Definitely, yeah. Because he's even training him to beat him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, right. I want you to train me so that I can kick your butt. I'm like, really? Okay, all right, I'll train you. <laughs> so that's, kind of, that's, that's a really interesting dynamic between those characters. And I think they have a real respect for each other. So I like that stuff. I like those... those uh, those episodes that deal with, uh, you know, concepts of honor and uh, th that's really fun to play. It's fun to get into. You, oh, this is going back to kind of older series, but uh, 
did you what's your thoughts on your character and and Gantz 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 yeah Oh wow, Gantz. I played a few characters in Gantz, but the the main character I played in Gantz was that me and Greg Ayers played two uh two punks who would like beat up homeless people. Yeah. Really, that was a really that was a really horrifying show. That's that one of the shows I almost I'm kind of like, uh, don't watch that show. I don't want to uh, no, I didn't do it. It's, there were lines I had to say in that show that were so heavy and so almost obscene. I was like, oh gosh, do I really have to say this? And Matt was like, Yeah, that's in the script. I'm like, oh God. Um it was super violent. And I, I, I didn't know how I felt about it because today sometimes I talk to directors and I say, okay, well, what's the show about? How violent is it? And is the violence like justified? Are you rooting for the bad guys? Are we trying to put a lot of blood and guts in this just because people go, oh, cool, man, there's blood and guts. Or is there, is there kind of a point to it, right? Because uh, I, I don't think I'd want to voice a show or a character where – um, you're supposed to like cheer for the bad guy. Mm-hmm. Um, but Gantz was, uh, that was a tough one. That was probably the toughest one to do just because of that whole issue is that we played such awful people, but they got what was coming to them. You know, mm-hmm. they didn't, uh, they didn't end up winning the day. They, they got in trouble in, at the end. Um, not giving away anything by saying that, but yeah, my characters are pretty bad people. And I played some smaller roles too here and there in Gantz. But mostly, mostly that character by the end. Mm-hmm. He was well, I, was just, evil. I was just about to ask too, like if what what your d- darkest emotional headspace you've had to go to for a role has been, if that was it. Probably so. It, was, it wasn't dark like. It wasn't dark like. Uh, I think the the toughest emotional place I had to go was when I when I played the father in uh, Phantom Memory Corral. Oh, okay. Because yeah. uh, he was the dad, and, and he was always emotionally distressed. He was always really, really concerned about Corral, about his daughter. And, and, uh, and so there were so many scenes where I was so troubled about what was going to happen to her mm-hmm. and, um, and uh, if she was going to be okay. So you really had to go to more of a sad place with that. That's not always easy to do when you just kind of walk into a studio. It's, it, it takes some getting into and um, when you're jumping around from scene to scene in an anime and you just got to stick with the anime schedule and you've only got like an hour and a half scheduled to perform and, and you've got to do a lot of emotional scenes and you don't have any, any way to kind of speed up and get into them, you know? Like if you're doing a stage play and you build up to it uh, or a film, um, it's tough. It's that, so that was, that was really challenging because it was a lot more emotional. Character in Gantz is real dark, but he's not really emotional. He doesn't care. He's just removed. He's like, he's just all violence. Right. So that wasn't as difficult, probably. Corral was tougher. Now that I think about it. I know, well, you, you played a darker character because I'm, I'm a really big fan of the, of the Xenosaga games. And I know you were in the Xenosaga series. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Xenosaga was, that was something. <laughs> Gosh, a lot of memories. I'm trying to trying to piece all this together. Xenosaga, um, he was, uh, uh, Chris Ayers uh, directed that, and he said that he saw Xenosaga's, uh, it was Albedo, right, was the yep. character. And um, he said that he saw the Japanese, and he immediately thought of me for that role. And I was kind of like, why? You know, <laughs> that's really interesting. I mean, I've played bad guys before, but Xenosaga was kind of fun to get into because he was almost comically evil. You know, he enjoyed being evil. It was almost like, here comes the bad guy, dun, dun, dun. You know, he's, you're not yeah. really scared of him necessarily. You are, but you're, there's, he's so bad and he's so nasty that, that it's almost, it was, there was a side of me that almost couldn't take him completely seriously. I was like, I can have a little bit of fun with this. I can have a little bit of sinister, you know, yeah, 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 fun with this guy because he's almost he's he's almost comically scary if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but he was he was he was a fun bad guy to play, and he had some funny moments later on. You know, he would he would be taunting people and then just go, nah, silly bastard." He would just like leave. Yeah, it was pretty. It was, it was there were some actually funny moments with him. I know another villainous character. I didn't get to do another- Sorry. Oh, I, another villainous character around that same time was when you were um, Moroga and Basilisk. Basilisk, I played a. I think I played a good guy in Basilisk. He was he was the uh, the blind sensei who was the uh, the mentor oh, yeah. to the lead role. 
yeah. Yeah, he was, uh, yeah, Basilisk was, uh, I was a good guy. I was the guy who was blind, but I had this kind of a, you know, extra sense. And I could, I could tell when villains were coming or, you know, our, our enemies were coming from miles away or, or whatever. And I had a very, that was another guy with a very, very strong moral code. Um, teaching his teaching the lead role uh, lead character and his name escapes me I'm sorry um, to, to just to be a better guy to be a better man and to temper his anger and to fight for good and, and you know be, be more noble and that, we did that at Funimation um, that was a Funimation title that I recorded that around the same time that I recorded like Trinity Blood yep. and Galaxy Railways and some a little bit of Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood and some other stuff over at Funimation. There was a time when I was going over there in the early 2000s a lot. <clears throat> and then I didn't go over there for a while. Um, and then uh, some new directors came in and, and, and I actually sent them a demo reel again and said, hey, you know, I'm, uh, I'd like to see what you guys are up to. And then I got a role in My Hero. And that was probably the biggest role I've gotten in a real long time was Gentle Criminal in My Hero Yep. Um, in, season, in season four. And I was happy about that role because he was British and I got to do an accent. You know, I, I don't normally get to do accents. A lot of directors just want my voice for specific types of roles, just my natural voice. And so I was really happy that Colleen let me be British. Um, and he was, he was funny and he was interesting and he wasn't a total bad guy. Right. So I hope he gets a, I'm hoping he gets a redemption arc. <laughs> Yeah, he shouldn't, he shouldn't go away completely. Who knows what's going to happen with that show? But yeah, that's what I was going to say. Is that it was nice that because uh, since there's obviously some really terrible villains in my hero, that he wasn't one of those people. Yeah, I think I think he's really interesting. I really liked him as a character. I liked that he was vulnerable. I liked that he and Labrava had these really sad backstories. Mm -hmm. You know, and I liked the fact that they were. YouTube personalities. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think that I tell people this a lot. I think it's really interesting. I don't think it's an accident that they're YouTube personalities because they have these sad backstories and they think that nobody wants them. And mm -hmm. they try to come back and be different people. And they use they use social media to try to be different people. Yeah. And there's a really interesting lesson in there maybe about hey, you know, don't think that social media like maybe the writers are trying to tell people, don't take social media too seriously. You can't, you've got to be who you are. You've got to be yourself. You can't hide behind something else, right? And I think a lot of people try to put out a persona on social media that they're not who they really are or that you're a stronger person socially on that, there than you are as a real person. But you've got to be who you are no matter what. You can't escape who you are. So I thought their arc was pretty interesting for that reason. A lot of people think it's just kind of a silly arc like, hey, we just got through overhaul, which was really intense. And all of a sudden, we're kind of joking around with these two guys who are these two characters who are just being on social media. And they're not really hurting anybody. Like, what's going on? But there's a different, there's kind of a different message there. There's a different, there's a different vibe with those two. And I kind of like that. Mm -hmm. Plus, I think that the... Yeah. the was a I think that the dynamic of their quirks together is... Uh, was cool too. Yeah, yeah. Her quirk. She started. <laughs> La Brava started trending on Twitter after, right after the episode came out, where she cried and broke down and everything like that. That was actually trending because her her love quirk was like yeah. tripping people out. I think that was really awesome. And the actress playing her is fantastic. Megan Shipman was really really good. And what's really cool is that half of the episodes that we did, we did six episodes in my hero with gentle and la brava but half of them were done right before covid hit mm. and then the other half were done after covid shut everything down covid yeah. shut down, it shut down the funimation studios everybody went home and worked from home and every actor in every series and every episode for the last year has been recording out of their own closet in their own house mm -hmm. so but the episodes all sound real consistent Right. Um, you're not really missing anything. You would, if you didn't know that that happened, you wouldn't recognize it. And that's how good those engineers were. They really did an incredible job making sure everything sounded, everything came together really well. So that was interesting. This is another uh, kind of more obscure title, but another one I really like. Uh, do you remember? Yeah. Being, do you remember being in Ghost Hound? Ghost Hound? Yeah. I actually don't. 
<laughs> I'm embarrassed. Ghost Town. Was that an ADV title or a fun? It was probably it was probably a Sentai title. Yeah, from what 2008. Wow, Ghost Hound. Okay, like like a hound dog. Well, it's like a yeah, well yeah, like the word, but it's it's a psychological horror series. Oh yeah, Ghost. Okay, okay, I think I remember that. Yes, yes, that was really obscure. Yeah, very, and it was probably a very short title. There, I'll be I'll be completely honest with you. There's a couple of titles that I don't even remember. Sometimes people will say, remember doing this and actors, if they're honest, they'll kind of go, huh? <laughs> then there'll be at a convention and go, I don't remember doing that because it literally takes you a couple hours. Like, Hey, we've got this two hours. Can you come in and record for two hours on a Tuesday? Yep. And you go in and record and you kind of forget about it. You go, okay, thanks. You know, you play a role for maybe 20 minutes. You got eight lines later on, two years later, you don't remember doing it. And there are, there are some, characters who I see or hear about and I see their faces and I go, I don't remember the voice I did for that character or I don't remember exactly what the plot was. It's really different when you do a play or you do a film because you remember the whole story. You remember all the background stuff. And um, so, wow, who did I play in Ghost Town? It was just, um, it was someone named Takashi and then there was like side characters. It was something like that, yeah. Oh, wow, okay. I'll have to go look that up. Okay. <laughs> what Thanks about, for reminding. Thank you for reminding me. Oh yeah. What about uh, Darker Than Black? Darker Than Black. I remember that. That okay, was a cool yeah. show. That yeah. was a fun show. I like that show a lot. Yeah. Got to play some badass characters in that. That's a great title too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the title alone is cool enough. Yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm moving on to kind of more modern yeah. series here. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, you got to be, yeah, a couple characters in Black Butler. Oh, yeah, Black Butler was great. Um, my main character in Black Butler was Arthur Randall. Yeah. He was the man from Scotland Yard, don't you know, and talks like this, and uh, the British uh, Scotland Yard detective. What's interesting, Colleen Clinkenbeer directed me in that, and she also directed me in My Hero, so the, she's only ever directed me playing British characters. So that's very interesting. We have a thing about British characters. She and, and she's a great director. She's really, really cool. She knows exactly what she wants. She's very pro about getting, about, uh, about how to work with people and how to get that out of the character and how to tell you exactly how to get there. Mm -hmm. She's, uh, she's, and she's been doing, cause she hasn't only been doing roles herself and she plays Luffy in one piece. So she's yeah. constantly in the studio uh, I, I don't know how she finds the time to direct and act in all the roles that she does, but she's, she's great. She's my favorite directors. And um, so she directed me in Black Butler and that was a, and I really enjoyed that show. That was one of the shows that I watched a few episodes of and got into a little bit. I didn't watch the whole series, but I, I enjoyed it so much that I wanted to know kind of where the plot was going. Mm -hmm. And it's a spooky, it's a spooky show, but it's also, um, it's got real dark elements to it. Super dark plot elements but it's also got some lighter stuff. Uh, it, it's a real interesting mixture of the story. The scripts are very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And my, uh, my single favorite an anime is uh, Kenshin. And I know that you were, in, uh, you were in the newer Kenshin movies. Kenshin, okay. That was pretty, that wasn't too recent. Yeah, 2012. Uh, 2012, yeah, it was a while ago. Yeah, almost 10 years ago. Gosh. Why is that your favorite show? I don't I don't know. Like I just What do you like the most about that? Well, just uh Kenshin's character, just um who he is, and I love shows that are set in feudal Japan and have that kind of plot. Um yeah. Yeah. and I was a really have big fan. What are you gonna say? I'm sorry. Have you checked out Blade of the Immortal? Yeah. That's that's kind of it's kind of set in the, some of the same or partly the same things. I'm not what you're talking about. That the the original, you know, the settings are the settings are very. Uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Similar. When you, when you sorry. Similar. Yeah, yeah. The settings are similar, but they're but they're but yeah. Kenshin was like uh, I know what you mean because there's something about there's nothing supernatural about the plots. In other words, I mean it's just more about. Real yeah, life in, in, in that kind of area. Yeah, because you were in a, you were in Peacemaker too. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. one. Of, yep. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'd do anything to be able to have that guy's haircut. He had some just <laughs> <laughs> he had the longest hair in the world. Hair hairstyles in anime make me very jealous because nobody can have that kind of cool hair. But yes, I, I remember when I was uh, working with the character Su Suzu, and um, you know, and I was a pretty dark guy. I mean, I was teaching teaching him to be uh, teaching them to be, um, you know, to have. I remember one of my favorite lines was, you know, patience. We'll we'll get our, our we'll get our, our enemies. We'll slowly smoke them out. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get them in ways that they don't expect. And, uh, but, and Peacemaker is another one of those shows too that had really dark elements, but some animes, they really have a good, those that have a real mix between the darker elements and the lighter comic stuff that can come in sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, to kind of give you some relief from the dark. They're not all dark. Right. They're, they're just, they're very, uh, there's, there's a mixture in, in, uh, in the storylines. Um, yeah, I, well, I guess considering it's a little a little while ago, do you remember your approach to playing Aoshi in the Kenshin movies or not really? Not really. I got to be honest with you now. Okay. Like <laughs> Eleven years ago, I don't remember that. No. <laughs> I want to go back and look at some of these now, so I can so I can uh, so I can see some of this stuff. But it's again, yeah, I'll be honest. Just full disclosure. Sometimes. There are there are several roles that I that I'd have to go back and look at again to to recognize even to recognize and go okay I remember that there's there's been um there, and there's only been a couple of anime that I've watched all the way through I watched uh, do you remember Excel Saga Oh yeah it's a crazy, crazy wacky anime I played I played a few really wacky characters in Excel Saga but I thought it was so wacky and nuts that I wanted to watch the whole thing it it almost gave me a headache watching it because it's like Full yeah. force all the time, all the way through. Just and um, <clears throat> and I watched Nadesco all the way through, and Bubblegum Crisis all the way through. I've been I started watching My Hero a long time ago, and and I binge watched My Hero to get into it so I could learn more about it after I auditioned for General Criminal, because um, I really wanted to be, be a part of that cast. And so I wanted to know more about that. And I think it's, I think it's really, really well written show. Yeah. Um, um, but other than that, I've not watched other anime. Oh, I watched Cromarty High School because Marty High School is just fun. I love that. Uh, I love that show. It's just super fun. Um, but the other ones have been, it runs a scale about how much I remember and how deep I got into it. Basilisk, I remember a lot about. I remember a lot about Trinity Blood. I remember a lot about Galaxy Railways. I remember. Um, some of these older shows, Princess Nine mm -hmm. was another show that I played a wacky vice principal. Um, and I really enjoyed doing that. That was really fun. Um, but yeah, some of these shows, I would have to go back and look because they, they were so long, long ago. And, and it didn't take very long to record them. So it's a little embarrassing, but at the same time, you want to get into it. Madlax is another one. And um, Macross. Yeah, Cross was a big one. A big role in, and you know, a lot of a lot of people like Macross a lot for some reason. They're really into that character. They bring him up a lot, and uh, that's that's strange, because because he, he doesn't he didn't strike me as a very emotional character, or very wide ranging. He was just kind of a robotic dude in charge. But yeah, so it's it it all depends on the show. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you're putting me through my paces. This is like a quiz show almost. <laughs> Don't know how well I do at the anime game show. Okay, so this is kind of more recent, but I'm sure that it was fun for you being in uh, Parasite. Oh, Parasite was great. Parasite the Maxim is a really, really cool show. I, I got to go to the Alamo Draft House because sometimes they do anime at the Alamo. Alamo is probably closed now, unfortunately, because of COVID. Yeah. But we would do anime at the Alamo and go get burgers and shakes and beer and watch anime for, you'd watch like four or five episodes of anime. We did it with Cromartie High School. We did it with um, Fibrain. We did it with uh, Princess Principal. And we had a night where we, we saw Parasite as well. And I loved Parasite. We started watching it from the beginning. And I, I started really getting into that show. A lot of my friends were in it. And my character had a really great speech. Um, he was the politician who was actually a Parasite. And, and he gets, well, I won't tell anybody, but he, he meets his end in a very interesting way with the army and, and the the and he's making this very big major speech at a podium and Kyle 
Jones, who directed it, did a parody of that. He had me come into the studio and do a parody of that scene again, where I'm just talking about anime in general. Oh. And I think you can find it on my Twitter way back in the day. I'll send you a link. I'll send you a link. It's really funny. Okay. It's really funny. <laughs> so he just talks about how, hey, I want you to watch Parasite the Maxim. And he's getting all serious about it. And he's talking about how when we sit down with greasy potato chips, we want this kind of plot in our anime. And he's getting all <laughs> mad about it. I'll send, you, I'll send you a copy of it. It's really great. Kyle did some good parodies of that. He also directed me in um, Akame Got Kill. Yeah. Which is, which is a really fun show. That's a badass show. And I played General Lever, <laughs> who controlled water mm -hmm. when, he, when he had a battle. That was, that was kind of interesting. And obviously, yeah, Parasite was cool. Obviously, uh, Food Wars is still a super popular show that you were. Food, food Wars is great. I'm sorry, my character, I'm sorry my character went away. I wish he'd come back because I, I got to do an accent, got to be a French chef. And he was like the Gordon Ramsay, but a French Gordon Ramsay. He was really a, he was really tough on the kids about judging their food, and he was funny, and uh, and a foreign guy. So I, I'm sorry that he went away because I love that show. That's a really fun show, and I love food. So who doesn't love food? And this is kind of a, this is kind of a, uh, it's it's recent, but it wasn't super popular. But it was cool because it's based off of. Older series, uh, Ushio and Tora. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Had a really quick run, quick uh, sessions doing the Ushio and Tora. I remember that. That was at Sentai. Stuff like Duraiku. Duraiku? Yeah. Wow. Duraiku. It's the name, the name is, is ringing a bell. Your, char um, your character was named uh, Ataru. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and that was recent. That was a Sentai too, very recently. Yeah, just a couple years ago. Okay, okay. Yeah, I remember that one. Vaguely. There was, there was a couple of other ones that I did that were all sports related. There was uh, Kiro no Soro and Haiku, which were based on volleyball and basketball. Right that are they're really making a killing these days because it's all about, you know, it's people are getting into sports anime. Even if it's about ice skating, they're all into the sports. Uh, Okiro no Sora was really fun because I got to play an old guy. I got to play a really crusty old guy with glasses and he's like the basketball coach. And he's just, you know, cranky and sounding like that. And that was, that was more fun because it's, it's, it's more fun to, I want to do roles where people don't know it's me and they don't recognize that it's my voice, mm -hmm. which doesn't happen very often. Um, <laughs> so when I walk in a studio and directors go, I say, well, what does this guy sound like? Cause I want to do something different. He goes, oh, it's just you. I'm like, oh, man, come on. You know, I want to do something different. Um, so I talk to Kyle and I say, I want to play an old guy. I want to play a, just a grumpy old man. He goes, okay, I got a role for you. <laughs> he gave me the coach, <laughs> you know, you're on a sorrow. So I don't know how into those shows you are about the sports things, because that's a whole different appeal. Um, but it's, and some of them are a lot more popular than others. I think high who is really popular. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's it's kind of interesting how anime series about sports or cooking or anything have a way to still be intriguing, and even if you're not into that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, they do. They've got to come up with it. It's 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 funny how they, they uh, how they they work that into the script. How they work these different these different conflicts and things into the script. There was even a show that we did recently about anime recording about people in anime. Yeah. And I played a director who's like, everybody's scared to audition in front of him. And he's really, cause he's really intimidating, but he doesn't even know it. He's like the super nerd with glasses on. And, and later on he's getting drunk with his actors and going, I'm not intimidating. And, um, but it's about an anime voice actress. <laughs> mm -hmm. So animes, so they're now making animes about people who want to become anime voice actors. So it's coming around full circle. It's very interesting, but that's fun. And what was your thoughts on your role in uh, um, Attack on Titan? Oh well, that was very brief. I had one. I had one appearance at one, and I and I have not followed that show. I've heard it's really intense. Okay. I'll be honest with you. I haven't watched Attack on Titan. I'm not sure I want to. It sounds like it's like it's so intense, <laughs> and it's like constant barrage of like it's like Game of Thrones level intense, and um, or more. 
And I might get into it. I might see if I like it. I might try to watch a season of it. But I just got into it late in the game, played a general who was like, he's got his hand always on his face like this the whole time. He just says all his lines like this. I was like, are you going to get your hand surgically removed from your face at some point? You know, he's always doing this. But um, and he was very kind of devil may care. He was just really like kind of plotting this kind of stuff. But then um, and I think that season, has that show completely ended? Have they had their finale? It just did. Or well, yeah, yeah. It, it ended. It's it's over. Mm -hmm. Wow. OK, well, don't tell me the end because I want to watch it. But okay. yeah, that was a huge and they, and they were going for several years. They recorded uh, the first few episodes in like 2013 or something, maybe even 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And they took a long break, I think, before they picked it up again. I think there was a long hiatus there between episodes of that show or between seasons of it, third or fourth season. Yeah. Yeah. They had to take a break. I'm not sure why, but yeah, that's, that's one of the bigger titles I've heard of in a while. You remember, well, it was like last year because you were a, uh... I think it was a bigger part in Seven Seeds. Oh yeah, Seven Seeds on Netflix. Um, yeah, my character was interesting. He he was kind of behind the scenes. He knew about all the bad goings on, but he didn't reveal it. You know, he he just wanted to get people involved in in the uh, in the plan, but not reveal everything to them. And so, yeah, he he showed up a couple of times, and he showed up in more in the season one than in season two. And I don't know if that show is continuing or not, but that's a spooky show. Yeah, that's got some really dark. That's got some really dark elements to it. Um, but it's it's uh, it's kind of almost like Survivor, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and you know where society is going to go if we if we. Uh, it takes a pretty cold look at the world. I mean, it's it's uh, it's pretty dark. Mm -hmm. But I think yeah, that was a good one. Well, it says that the the last couple things that you were that you had bigger parts in. One of them was. Uh, is it wrong to pick up girls in a dungeon? <laughs> yeah, he's not got a huge role, but I like him. He's a, he's a big tough guy. He's he's uh, guarding his uh, guarding his goddess with all his might. Uh, somebody just put a clip on Twitter the other day about how he he had the angriest he's ever gotten when he had to really put 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 the hammer down on somebody who was uh, committing blasphemy against their goddess. But that's a that's become a real popular show with a lot of people. Uh, Daimachi. Um, but I like I like my character in that. I like I like him. He's uh he's another one of those big stoic guys. They uh oh and something we just did was Baki the Grappler got a new dub. Oh yeah at Sentai at Sentai. And I'm a really tough dude. I'm a I'm a I'm a tough character who meets my match in a few scenes, but he's a he escapes from prison. He, you know, he's a he's a really he's like a he has the power to conduct poisonous gas from his hands and just and, and do all kinds of really that's a tough that's a tough battle show that's a really tough show that's almost like some gantz level violence in that thing um and i've got some friends who are all over that show i've got a lot of my actor friends in town who are in that show playing one guy's playing the lead he's playing baki he's a friend of mine and and um and i didn't know that going into the studio i didn't know who was in the cast and sometimes you can recognize people when you hear their voices and i didn't recognize anybody and then i found out they were doing it um, but Baki's a real, that's a, yeah, Shannon Reed is directing that at Sentai. And I think we're done with that show. I think they just, I think it's just a small, it's a short run of a series. And we did it a couple months ago, but they gave it a brand new dub. And then I saw it on Netflix with the old dub. And I don't know if ours is going to get, going to get fit in there or not. Um, a lot of stuff showing up on Netflix. Uh, Saint Seiya. Yeah. They're redoing all the old Saint Seiya episodes are getting redone and I'm playing Master Moo in those. And and we're doing a and they're also 3D animating Saint Seiya Knights of the Zodiac and that's on Netflix also and I'm playing Mu in that and uh, talk about a character I don't look like at all I would never have cast me as that character as Mu he's a I don't know if you've seen Mu <laughs> Mu's like got dots on his face and like purple hair and those outfits are something else uh, that's uh, you'll never see me doing that cosplay I'll say that. <laughs> That's not gonna happen. Yeah, because Saint 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 Seiya is uh, it's still like super popular, especially with European yeah. yeah audiences. Yeah, it's a it's a classic story. It's a it's a real classic anime story. It's really cool. I like doing those old. I like doing those remakes of those retro shows. They're really fun. There right. Venus Wars. Venus Wars was another one. Um, it was a movie 
Venus Wars, and we did we redid the dub with uh, Mike Kamado at Sentai, and I got to play um, guy who runs the the shop where all the kids are hiding out, and um, and I had a lot of fun with him. I liked him in the old retro anime. There's something the classic stuff is really fun to redo and revisit. Oh, I love uh, I love Megazone Twenty Three too. And I know that. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right, Megazone. Golly. Keep my entire career is flashing before my eyes. It's <laughs> great. Well, so it says the last thing that you were a part of that, well, it ran for several years, but uh, Log Horizon. Right, I'm still I'm still recording Log Horizon episodes. They brought back season three, and I'm still playing Karishin in in that. And that's an interesting. That is a really interesting casting for me because I normally don't play these younger guys, and he's just got this younger sounding voice. He's kind of more up like this. And he's just, you know, kind of innocent, <laughs> sounding. He's a little conniving, but he really doesn't sound much like me. And, and, and I'm surprised I got that role. I was happy to get that role because I say, hey, wow, I get to play somebody a lot younger than me um, or just who sounds a lot younger. Um, he's a lot of fun to record because he, he gets in over his head a lot, right, in the plot of that show. Always trying to work both sides against the middle and, and, and play to his best interest, but he always ends up kind of getting, getting himself in some trouble. And so it's fun to see how he keeps goofing up. But, uh, but Log Horizon is very popular. I like that show a lot. I'm glad to be a part of it. And we're still, we're still making new episodes. Um, Funimation picked it up. And we've been recording. Uh, like I said, everything I've been recording for Funimation over the last year, 13 months, 14 months now, has been here in Houston, uh, upstairs, out of my closet, in my little booth upstairs. I fashioned a little recording booth up there. And, um, and it works, it works really well. And, uh, uh, but they've been recording Log Horizon and My Hero and I've done an episode of, in fact, ever since, ever since the COVID situation hit and more directors get to use more actors who live in Houston and other parts of the country without having to bring them into the studio, that's actually really helped them and helped and could help other studios too who can use that as a way of recording other actors because the, the talent pool can be bigger now and I don't have to jump in my car and drive eight hours, you know, to and from and get a hotel room and go to Funimation. I just, yeah. Hey, want to do this tomorrow? Sure. Go record it. So I recorded an episode of fire force, um, oh, yeah. some stuff I probably wouldn't have done otherwise. I did a, a couple of black clover characters, little minimal characters, did an episode of fire force, really evil character in fire force. Uh, I don't know if you saw that episode. These are like a cult leader practically. Um, really violent um that was a shocking episode and then um let's see fire force and log horizon and we just started recording mars red okay funimation i'm playing an army general in that one of the army guys in that so yeah a lot of cool stuff has come up lately from i think helped by the fact that we don't have to travel to record these roles that we found a way to uh, make home studios work and and you don't have to be in the same room with the director as long as you can hear the director and get your and, and they can tell you what they need and you can see the video live over the net over the internet on your on my laptop just like I'm talking to you. And that's how we do it. And it's it's been working great. I hope it continue to work that way. Mm -hmm. So do you have a because the way that I end every interview I do is I ask, uh, do you have a answer as to what you want your legacy to be? In terms of your career my legacy yeah <clears throat> oh gosh um you know I, th I think it would be uh hopefully with people in the industry just that i was fun and easy to work with um that uh that i showed up on time and did my job <laughs> that i had some integrity that that uh and with fans just that just that they enjoyed what I did and that I was versatile. I, I, I take pride in being a versatile voice actor. Mm. I, I don't want to do the same kinds of things over and over. And I hope that what, if I'm remembered for anything, it's that I had uh, some, some good range and that part of my legacy hopefully will be that you can't recognize me, that there's some roles that you hear that you'll never guess it was me. And then you'll have to be told it was me. Mm. How about that? There we go. That'd be a good one. That'd be cool. I hope that helps. Well, thanks. This was fun for me to do. Hey, I really appreciate you getting a hold of me. This was really fun. I'm glad we did this. Thanks very much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be sure to send you the link once I get it up on YouTube.
Yeah, that's great. Hey, I have a question for you, actually. I noticed, I looked at a couple of other uh, interviews you did. One was with Brittany Karbowski and, and some other friends of mine. And when I, when I started watching the YouTube video, it like, it started kind of maybe partway into the conversation. Um, and, I, and I thought that was interesting. Was there, I wonder if there was a reason for that or? Oh, like uh, the beginning. You know, just sometimes I, for, sometimes I like forget to start recording at the very beginning of it and I can't really <laughs> do anything. <laughs> But okay. I made sure to yeah, not do it this time. I'm a video guy. I'm on the internet too. I know, I know the feeling. Okay. I was just curious. Yeah. Thanks. I appreciate, I appreciate this. This is really fun. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So I'll, I'll have it up. Like, okay. Hey, well maybe, maybe I'll run into you one day at a convention. Hopefully we'll get back out to conventions pretty soon enough. And maybe I'll see you. Maybe I'll see you in person one day. I'm in, I'm in, um, I'm up by Minneapolis. I don't know if you've ever been here for, I've been to Minnesota. I, I've been to Minneapolis actually. To do, was it was it Anime Fusion? Uh, it's probably Anime Detour, maybe. Oh, oh, you know, I did Anime Fusion, and they were associated with Anime Detour, so it was a, generally almost the same area. So that's okay. that's the closest I've been to your neck of the woods. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, thanks. Maybe I'll someday be. in the future, man. Yeah. Hopefully so. All right. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah.